Welcome to my new series on the Laplace transform. In this video and the videos going forward, we're going to study some of the reasons why the Laplace transform is an incredible, powerful piece of mathematics. In this first video, we're going to define the Laplace transform. We're going to see a couple different examples where we're going to compute the Laplace transform. But why might we be interested in something called a Laplace transform in the first point? One reason why I really like the Laplace transform is it's useful for solving differential equations like this one. Here I have an ordinary differential equation together with two different initial conditions. In general, differential equations can be very challenging, although this specific one can be solved as it's a constant coefficient, homogeneous one, relatively straightforward. However, the point of a Laplace transform is to convert differential equations like this, ones that have derivatives in them, into somehow an algebraic equation. This is some new equation. It's got a new y in terms of a new variable s, but there's no derivatives involved. It's just a purely algebraic equation. And indeed, in this particular case, it's very simple to solve for y. I can just divide through. And so one of the powers of the Laplace transform is going to be able to convert differential equations into algebraic equations that we're able to solve. And then we're gonna learn how we can convert backwards and take the solution to the algebraic equation and figure out a solution to the original differential equation. So that's our plan for the future, but right now in this first video, we're simply going to define the Laplace transform and we're going to compute what the Laplace transform is in three different examples. The notation for the Laplace transform is I drew a sort of squiggly L, and what this squiggly L does is it has an input, which is some function of t. And then you're going to take that f of t and via the Laplace transform, you're going to transform it into some other function, now a capital F. And this other function depends on some other variable, now s. So Laplace transform is, is kind of like a function, which would take a point to a point, but a Laplace transform takes a function to a different type of function. Here's how it's defined. The Laplace transform, this capital F of s, is defined to be the improper interval from 0 up to infinity of e to the minus st, notice that's where the s comes in, of f of t dt. Because we're doing an integral with respect to t, the t is going to go away so that what you get for your f of s is it only depends on the value of the s, this thing that comes in by this negative exponential. Because this is an improper interval, we're going to have questions like when does this converge and when does it not converge? Nevertheless, this is the definition, so let's see some examples. The first one I want to begin with is just going to be the Laplace transform of an exponential function. So I'm going to have e to the at, where a is just some constant. All right, so what's its Laplace transform? We can just simply write it down. So this is the improper integral from 0 up to infinity, e to the minus st. I just copy that. And then for the ft, I plug it in. I plug in the e to the at. This is two different exponentials, so I can combine the exponentials, the powers of them, and make it just a minus s times t. This is a straightforward enough integrand, so when you integrate that, you're going to get e to the a minus s times t, and then you have to divide out by a minus s, and we're evaluating this between 0 and infinity. By the way, because we're doing improper integrals, the technical way to define these is to replace the infinity sign with, say, a b, and then take the limit as b goes to infinity. Nevertheless, we have this shorthand to sort of evaluate it at zero and infinity. Okay, so uh, putting this together and getting rid of the mess, this is my claim. How do I evaluate that? Well, it depends on the a and the s. And the question of whether this is going to converge when you take this limit as some value goes to infinity, is that going to be a finite number or not? Well, it depends on the a and the s. So, for example, if s is greater than a, we're going to get one case, and if f is less than or equal to a, you'll get another. When s is greater than a, in the exponent, you have e to, well, a negative number times t as t goes to infinity. It's already just really windy and howling outside, but you know what? We're in the middle of COVID-19. i got to record the video now, nevertheless, so you can hear some random wind noises. Just ignore that. Anyways... And then if you take t to infinity of a negative exponential, it just goes away to zero. And so indeed, in this case, it just converges as zero. And then when you plug in the zero, you get an e to the zero over the a minus s and, and the end just one over s minus a. In the other case where s is less than or equal to a, well, if it's equal, then just in the denominator, you have a division by zero, it diverges. And if the s is strictly less than a, it's, it's going to be, well, it's going to be an exponential 
that has a positive times a t going to infinity, likewise, it's going to diverge. So in this example, we figured out how to compute the Laplace transform of this exponential function. And we've noted that the answer that we get does depend on what the value of s is relative to this constant a, and you sometimes get it diverging and sometimes get it converging. Before we get to our second example, I want to introduce a new function to us. I'm going to call this a step function, or sometimes called the heavy side function. What this function does is it's zero when t is less than zero, and it's one when t is bigger than zero. And then the example I want to compute out is actually the Laplace transform, not just of the step function, but of the step function u of t minus a. What this u of t minus a looks like is, well, something like this. The idea is that when your t is going to be less than a, then it's just going down to zero. And then when your t is greater than a, it's going to be of height one. This is a very useful function because if you have any function that you think should have a discontinuity at some particular spot, when you multiply by this u of t minus a, where a is the spot where you want to have a discontinuity, it introduces a discontinuity. And so this is a wonderful way to be able to model a lot of functions that have step discontinuities. You just sort of multiply by this heavy side function or this step function. Nevertheless, our goal is to compute the Laplace transform of this function. Well, let's write it down. So again, it's our integral, but now our integral doesn't start at zero to infinity because the function is just the function zero all the way up to the value of a. So the portion of the integral that's zero up to a is just going to be equal to zero. Here, by the way, I'm assuming that a is a positive constant. So the integrand has that negative exponential that is part of the definition of the Laplace transform, and then it just multiplies by one, but what really is happening with the step function is it's restricting the domain. So it's now it's a to infinity, not zero to infinity. Nevertheless, it's an easy integrand, we can compute that, and when you plug in the infinity, because it's a negative exponential, it goes away to zero. Our assumption here is that a is positive, and as a result, it's just going to be e to the minus s a divided by a. It's what happens when you plug in the lower limit that t is equal to a. All right, so now let's do our third example, but before we do that, I want to introduce a new piece of terminology. I want to introduce something called the gamma function. The gamma function looks a little bit related to the Laplace transform, and indeed it will be in just one moment, but for now it's just an improper integral from zero to infinity, very similar. The specific exponential e to the minus t, and then multiplied by t to the x minus one dt. This is some function, and it turns out to be important enough that we give it a name, and so we call it the gamma function. Okay, the gamma function has actually many very pleasing properties. The first sort of simple one is just that the gamma function of one turns out just to be one. If you plug in x equal to one, then you get t just to the zero, which just becomes a negative exponential. You can integrate that and get one. But perhaps more interestingly is I want to see what happens to the gamma function when I evaluate it at an integer n plus one. So if I do that and I plug this in, well, t to the n plus one minus one just becomes a t to the n. So now this is some sort of expression here. If you thought about how you might have to integrate this, well, you could do integration by parts n different times to reduce that t to the n down to a 1. But I'm actually only going to do it once and try to get some sort of recursive behavior that I can use. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set u equal t to the n. I'm going to set dv equal to e to the minus t dt. And I'm going to do an integration by parts. What this gives me is the following long expression. So I get a u times a v evaluated at the endpoint zero to the infinity, and then I subtract off a v du, and that gives me this expression. Now for the first part that's evaluated at infinity and zero, well, e to the negative infinity is going to dominate the polynomial and it's going to give a zero. And when you plug in zero, you get, well, just zero to the end, you're likewise going to get zero. So the, the first portion of this is just all zero. What about the second portion? Well, the second portion kind of looks like another gamma function. There is an n mixed in there, so we have to take that n and bring it out, but other than that, it's just n times the gamma function of n. So what I've done here is I've related the gamma function of n plus 1 to the gamma function of n, and it brought out this coefficient n. I could do the exact same argument again, and I could say, well, look, I'm going to take the gamma n and relate it to gamma of n minus 1, and that will bring out an n minus 1. And then I can just keep going in this way time and time again, going all the way down gamma n, gamma n minus 1, gamma n minus 2, and so forth, all the way down to 1. 
we've seen that gamma 1 was 1. And so really what we just have is just n factorial, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and so forth. So it's quite pleasing that for n factorial, which has never been a function that we've thought of as sort of this thing you could go say and take derivatives of or integrate, now can be expressed as this particular improper integral. One of the nice things that we have is a bit of a generalization of the factorial. For example, you could ask what gamma of, say, one half is. You don't have an answer for what one half factorial should be defined as, but now you can express it in terms of this particular integral and compute out that integral, and it turns out to have some very nice properties. All right, so with the gamma function defined, now let me turn to this problem of computing the Laplace transform of just a polynomial t to the n. It turns out that we're going to be using the gamma function in our computation. Indeed, if we write out what our expression is going to be, well, f of s, the Laplace transform, is just the improper integral e to the minus st times t to the n dt. I'm going to try to clean this up a little bit to make it look more like the gamma function by doing the substitution u equal to s times t. If I do that, well, the exponential is just going to become e to the minus u, but then further, I can say that the t to the n is going to become a u to the n, but it divides out by an s to the n that goes on the bottom. And then, and then likewise, when the dt turns into a du, you also have to divide by one more copy of s. So what you get is 1 over s to the n plus 1 stuck out the front, and then some integral entirely in terms of u. Now we can recognize this integral as just being the gamma function, so I have that same coefficient at the front, but now I just have the gamma function evaluated at n plus 1, and we had computed that out, that was just n factorial. So our final answer for the Laplace transform of t to the n is n factorial over s to the n plus 1. So that is that for... So those are my three examples of computing out the Laplace transform, and in the next video we're going to see three different properties that the Laplace transform has. If you have questions about this video, leave them down in the comments. If you want to see more differential equations or any of my other courses, links to those playlists will be down in the description. Give the video a like for that YouTube algorithm, and we'll do some more math in the next video.